I've refined the types of guests I'm looking for because 100% is about storytelling. You have to dig out your personal feelings in a compelling way that the listener is going to resonate. If the listener hasn't worked to harvest, but they sure as heck know what it is to slip a disc, feel that pain, and still have to carry on. As we say in writing, show, not tell. So don't tell me it was a hard, difficult harvest. Show me some details that speak to that. Be a communicator first and a wine expert second. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 219. What's behind the power of podcasts and how they evoke the theater of the mind? How can you use a hook to improve your communication skills? And why do stories help us remember what we learn about wine? You'll hear all those tips and stories in my chat with Lawrence Francis, host of the Interpreting Wine podcast. Lawrence is actually interviewing me, and I have lots of juicy stories and tips to share with you. Now a quick update on my upcoming memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Defamation, and Drinking Too Much. Lately, I often get caught up in the flurry of doing too many things to prepare for the book and its launch, and my mind is often racing ahead to which journalist to contact for potential reviews, which venues to book for launch parties, and which bonuses to create for those who pre-order my memoir. By the way, you can do that right now. <laughs> Slow breathing helps, but I've discovered another technique while listening to another podcast. It's part of CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and it's called 54321. So you look around where you are, and note five things that you can see. A snow-laden pine tree, a neon restaurant sign, etc. Then you note four things you can hear. Traffic, kids' voices, some sort of music. Then it's three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. But that last one, it's usually just my tongue, or spit, I don't know. (laughs) But the point is, that not only does it slow down my worried monkey brain, which can't think of two things at the same time, but it also makes me supremely present in the moment and in my current environment. It literally makes me stop and smell the roses or the cantaloupe, whichever is nearby. Let me know if this technique helps you too. Here's a review from Kathy DaCosta, a beta reader in Toronto. Quote, this inspirational book, would be interesting to read for a book club and allow for discussions about overcoming divorce or job loss. The personal details made me feel sad at many points, but then I felt satisfied at how things turned out. Nothing in this book is easy or trite. The book explores the idea of self-care and control in regards to personal relationships and career. I like the fast-paced style with the action being driven by dialogue. The humor is sprinkled in very appropriately to balance the tension of the book. Honestly, it's a fabulous book and a fast read, so even people who aren't women or don't drink wine would enjoy it. I'd rate it a five. Thank you, Kathy. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 219. This is where I share more behind-the-scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. Okay, on with the show. So 
So I do have a bottle that sort of started it all, that aha moment or aha bottle, and it was a Brunello. I'd grown up on the East Coast, Nova Scotia, where it was beer and whiskey on the table. Not that I was drinking that as a tot, but I didn't get into wine until I finished graduate school. So I didn't have the money, I didn't have the interest, and I didn't have that family background that would have led me Mm. naturally into having wine. So my then husband and I went out for dinner a lot because neither of us cooked. And I remember the first time we went to a small Italian bistro just around the corner from our tiny little apartment in Toronto. And he said, well, do you want a Brunello? And we thought, sure, sounds like a great Mm -hmm. pasta dish. (laughs) And he brought just two plain tumblers, no fancy sniffing or sipping, and poured this wine. And I just remember as I brought it up to drink it, didn't even notice swirl or sniff, but I remember the aromas and I thought, Mm -hmm. wow, what is this? And then I tasted it and I had another wow. And I thought, this is unlike anything I've ever had alcohol wise or otherwise. And that really not only gave me a thirst for wine, but a thirst to find the words to describe the experience so that I could have it again and again and again. And, you know, for me, it was only later as I started writing about wine that I kind of realized what was happening in that moment. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite writers is actually an American writer, MFK Fisher, in the 1940s. And she said, you know, when I write about hunger, I'm really writing about love and the hunger for it. And I kind of think of that when I'm writing about wine, it's our hunger, our thirst for love, and Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. what happens over a great glass of wine, whether it's, you know, the conversation, the connection, the communion, the love. (laughs) I think that is what we're all seeking to get really fundamental about it. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it's not just love, but it's lust as well. So I tend to write about the buzz of wine, the sensuality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a reviewer called my first book, Red, White, and Drunk All Over, a bodice ripper, (laughs) kind of in the (laughs) style of Jane Austen or something like that. (laughs) Not writing wise, but at least the the sensual part, because sometimes yeah. I think we talk about wine as though we're wearing business suits and sitting in a boardroom. It's all gray. And yet wine is so alive, so sensual. There's so many parts that it brings forward in us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And very poetic. I like the bodice ripper or yeah, <laughs> maybe it should be a sort of a cork ripper. Yeah. I mean, it sounds as though this experience sort of opened up really I guess opened your eyes kind of to that world and, and then yeah maybe I just invite you to pick up the journey then how did you sort of go deeper I did in both the bottle and the <laughs> writing of course we went back to that little bistro every week and had the same wine the same pasta dish for a year but then I started to explore and just realized just how diverse and wonderful the world of wine is But, you know, my dream was always to be a writer, but I didn't have the confidence to think Mm. I could be paid to write. But as I got deeper into wine and took a sommelier diploma and continued on that journey, wine was the hook that Mm -hmm. gave me Mm -hmm. the confidence Mm -hmm. to write. I was actually on maternity leave. I was in the world of high tech and I pitched an article about wine on the internet Now, you know how long ago this was, because that was news. (laughs) And so back in the Paleolithic era, I think, of that. But that was successful. And then that just led me to cold call and pitch other editors of newspapers and magazines. And I didn't go back to tech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, But what I mm -hmm. wanted to do was really kind of in parallel tracks, improve my writing as I improve my knowledge about wine. And so I really started looking to the new journalist school of storytelling. Mm-hmm. So Truman Capote, Joan Didion, and so on, George Plimpton. So what they did is, you probably know about these folks, Lawrence, but they did what they wrote about. So George Plimpton wrote a famous book about football, and he joined the team. He didn't just yeah. write about yeah. them from the bleachers. Yeah. Yeah. He actually did the thing uh-huh. so that uh-huh. he could go deeper into the feelings, into the experiences. And so that's kind of what I tried to do mm-hmm. with Harvest, becoming a sommelier, and so on. I yeah. really tried to get into the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you reminded me, there's a, an expression that I use a lot, which is wine is not a spectator sport. You know, it's one of those incredible pieces of storytelling, of geography, of art, but ultimately it can be drunk. So, you know, absolutely. Yeah. 
why write about it from the bleachers? Why not get down on the pitch and start kicking when it's so accessible? I love that, Lawrence. Wine isn't a spectator sport. So just to expand on what I mm. mentioned, but mm. I went and worked the harvest with Bonnie Doon, Randall Graham in California, who is crazy and wise and witty and gave me lots of great stories, but actually picking the grapes and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. working inside the winery instead of just sitting down and interviewing him. And then for the sommelier chapter in the first book, I worked at a five diamond restaurant, fancy French restaurant, had to put on a tuxedo the whole thing. And even though I had a sommelier diploma, I was terrified of spilling wine or not knowing a question because, I mean, Psalms, as you know, are just encyclopedic in yeah. their knowledge yeah. and you're never done learning. Uh -huh. So I thought uh -huh. someone's going to trip me up tonight. And they did. But that's part of the story. That's okay. And then, you know, I worked in a couple of wine stores to talk about how to buy wine. So I was helping customers on the floor. So each one, sort of the info or the education was mm, buried mm, in the mm, story. Mm, so as mm. I say, my mother used to hide the peas in the mashed potatoes. It's a good <laughs> way to learn about wine. So instead of telling you the 64 steps on how champagne is made or the difference between the larger houses and grower champagne, let's enter the stories of the Merry Widows of Moose, what I call them, Merry Widows of Moose, Veuve Clicquot and Louise Pomeray mm, and mm, so mm. on. Let's get into the story and through that, let's learn about wine. And I think, I know, you'll remember more about it yeah. because our brains are wired for story. You have a hook to hang those mm, facts mm, on mm, as mm, not mm. A, just a laundry list of things you need to remember. Yeah, exactly. It's not like uh, just studying for an exam, is it? I think I think that you can you can make that sort of yeah deeper deeper connection. So I'm right in thinking then that that bottle was literally incredibly life changing, and you went off on a very different path there. And yeah. just sort of, yeah, zoom out a little bit. Yeah. What was the sort of time period that we're talking about? Because as I say, it does, does seem like, yeah, a really, really massive transition that you've gone through there. It was because I was in high tech marketing. I worked for a supercomputer company that was based in California, although at the time and still today, I live in Canada. But I was commuting back and forth once a quarter. I started planning all my visits to the corporate headquarters, which is now the Google campus on Thursdays and Fridays so I could drive up to Sonoma and Napa and just spend the weekend mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. That was before my son was born. But then, of course, I went on that leave. And I always reassure my son, he's not the reason I started to drink. I, <laughs> he didn't drive me to it. But I just had that extra time. I'd never taken vacation, a type personality, of course. I had a year off on that leave and just decided to dive into it. By that time, I had finished the sommelier diploma and pitched the articles and then mm -hmm, got mm -hmm, into mm -hmm, writing mm -hmm, full time. Mm -hmm. And then just the journey went from there with two books with Random House, you know, later mobile apps that I still have that scan barcodes and front labels to the courses I teach online and the podcast more recent, well, 2018. Yeah, unbelievable. So yeah, I mean, I would just again, yeah, welcome you to, yeah, take us back through a little bit that evolution. So you've taken us up to really, I guess, you know, writing and releasing the first book. The courses then come after that. And are we sort of, you know, still sort of evolving and expanding really, I guess, your reach and yeah, your ability and your infrastructure really to communicate about wine. Yeah. So the book one came out in 2006, Red, White and Drunk All Over. Unquenchable mm -hmm. was 2011. Mm -hmm. And I have a new book coming out in 2023 that we could talk about later. Sure, so I've always sure. been interested in long form narrative. And in mm. fact, I would say I was quite a little writing snob <laughs> because <laughs> in my columns, I convinced my editors I should just do long form storytelling, no wine reviews. Yeah. Like I would talk yeah. about wine, of course, in the columns, but I didn't want sidebars of wine reviews because I thought, oh, those are the recipes of the wine world. Who cares? I mean, they're just not challenging to write. But I quite got over myself. And it's the subject of this new wine memoir. But it took me a while mm, to realize mm, that mm. more people read wine reviews and recipes than they do memoirs and long form books and so on. So to be of service which is an important part of being a wine educator, commentator, and mm -hmm, so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to value not only your work, but the work of other people, their wine reviews as well, and not just dismiss them as, oh, well, that's like 
you know, in a newspaper reporting on house fires, the real action is if you're bylining on the editorial page. So as I said, I wasn't a wine snob, I was a writing snob, but it took an evolution over time to get over that and realize just how many people find wine reviews useful as consumers, as wineries. They really depend on those wine reviews to help and promote and sell their Mm -hmm, wines. mm -hmm. And that I needed to take my own work seriously because of that, you know, that aspect of it. I couldn't just be unidimensional on the book. So from there, it expanded into the courses and so on that I can also talk more about. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And I think there's sort of different directions that we could take this in. But you mentioned the P word there, the podcast, which was, I think, was how we first connected with one another. And I've learned something new about you just now, you know, which is your love for long form. I mean, I think we both share that. And I've explored that. And I see the medium of podcasting as a fantastic way to kind of bring that forward. So I wonder if, yeah, is that a sort of a relevant connection to make? And then would you just sort of, yeah, again, take us through a little bit into that seam of the podcast and what's that been like for you? Absolutely. So podcasts are the long form version of books. And Mm -hmm. of course we have audio books, but it used to bother me as a writer that I didn't read physical books. My eyes get tired, they get dried out, (laughs) but I read or listen to, I call it reading, but listen to hundreds of audible books. So Mm -hmm. I'm an audible learner. And I think more and more people are realizing just what's available to them via audio. And that's why podcasts are exploding because people Mm -hmm. know Mm -hmm. that there's all those audible learners out there who would prefer to get their information that way, but we're all overtaxed and busy. And as you know, you can multitask while you're listening to a podcast, whether you're walking the dog or folding laundry or whatever you're doing in the car, everywhere. Podcasts are more easily consumed than I think any other media. I certainly can't drive and read a physical book. (laughs) And, you know, even videos, I love videos as a communication tool, but even they are not as powerful as podcasts Mm -hmm. because you have to sit Mm -hmm. down, commit to watch a video, whereas podcasts can be anywhere, anytime, any place. And that is very, very powerful. And then of course, beyond that, I just find that the human voice is so intimate and so telling. I mean, I know you know this, Lawrence, but you know, there's the pauses, Mm -hmm, there's the mm -hmm. breath taken, there's the emotion that you cannot get on text. And that sure you can get on video, but you have to be sitting there and watching it. But with podcasts, you can have all of this intimacy and evoke that theater of the mind where the listener enters into even those spaces between what you're saying and co-creates with you what you're saying. They're envisioning mm-hmm, mm-hmm, the winery mm-hmm. you're talking about. They're thinking about how that wine tastes through your voice. And I think that is so powerful. Yeah, 100%. I think it's something that I got to that place, I would say, over time. And I still remember a time where I was scared to do an episode more than 20 minutes because maybe overthinking it. And I thought, oh, they're only listening when they're commuting or they're only listening when they're on the treadmill and no one stays on the treadmill for more than 20 minutes. So I thought, you know, I've got to keep it kind of short for those people. Do you remember kind of coming in with that awareness of, of audio? Because, you know, I think maybe it's something that's developed over time, but you know, if you sort of had that already, I think that's really fascinating having that confidence really to go deep right from the start. So Lawrence, yeah, picking up on what you've just said there, and you probably have more up-to-date stats than I do, but I know that people finish long podcasts. They've done industry studies where, I don't know what it is, 60, 70, 80% or more finish an hour-long podcast, whereas the average playtime, attention time to a Facebook video, you're lucky if you get three to five seconds. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. considered Mm -hmm. a view. Mm -hmm. So think about how committed to the long form Mm -hmm. podcast Mm -hmm. listeners are just as book readers are. They're in it. And to me, going deep inside either of those two media means, you know, loyalty. It means understanding, connection, conviction. And that's what we want. I mean, we're all hit with hundreds, thousands of social media messages and texts and emails and billboards and everything else that consumes our attention. But you've got someone, even if they're multitasking, 
when they're listening to a podcast. And so for me personally, I've always found the most gratification in writing long form mm, mm, narratives. Mm, so I mm. thought there's got to be a corollary there with long form audio podcasting. You know, even before I could listen to audio books, I had a satellite radio by my bed as a child and I would listen to the BBC blow in and out over the Atlantic because I just wanted to yeah, listen. Yeah, yeah. It was just magical, right? And even when people today read my books, if they listen to my podcast, it's almost like a ghost effect in a good way. They're mm -hmm. hearing my voice read that book to them. There's a lingering impact and effect of being a podcast listener. And, you know, I think proof is that when you publish a video, mm -hmm. people can stand it if the seeing part is a little fuzzy. They cannot yeah. stand it yeah. if the yeah. audio is off yeah. of what people are saying. Like, it's like watching Netflix and bad dubbing. <laughs> it drives people crazy. And to me, that says audio is more important. It's more fundamental to who we are. And the worst audible book reviews are those that have narrators mm -hmm. whose mm -hmm. voice does mm -hmm. not match mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the original author's content or, you know, message. Yeah, that's super powerful, really. I think, yeah, to have that awareness and to kind of come in with that worldview and that appreciation of, as you say, just how powerful podcasts can be. You know, it was actually one of the main reasons why I really started and tried to grow my Instagram account at the same time uh -huh. as starting the podcast, because again, it I knew that it would be a non-visual format through which I'd be making a connection with people. And sort of, you know, back in 2018, there were lots of wine tastings and lots of events and ways to connect in real life. And I didn't want people to not know what I look like <laughs> because I think people, they hear your voice. And I think you can't help but make a visual picture of somebody, yes. you know, even if somebody's never seen me or, or seen you, if you give them a tape of one of our podcast they'll fill in the blanks and I often I align listening to audio to exactly the point you made earlier around it. it's like watching the book versus watching the movie it's like the director and the actors and everybody they have to lay it out there for you with the video and the film with the book everybody has their own unique experience and I'm convinced yeah. that there's something very similar happening with podcasts and another audio as well yeah, there is. And with podcasts, you get this extra bonus. I mean, there's so many bonuses, but it's a digital asset that has a legacy. Mm -hmm. Like I get emails all the time that say, I just listened to your back catalog of 150 episodes. Yeah, People will do that. They yeah. will binge listen. Yeah. I've never had someone say, I've just watched all your Facebook videos. <laughs> <laughs> so it's portable. And even though things get updated and facts change mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. It's evergreen content because people will do that. Once they find you, they're already committed to long form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a good chance they're going to go back and just use it as a way to learn about wine or whatever your topic is and listen to everything you've published. Do you have a view on why that might be? It's something that I have come across myself as well. And people, yeah. when we first connect, they'll often say, yeah, I'm starting back at number one. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I'm like, good luck <laughs> catching up. I'm on number <laughs> 450 now. But I'm just curious, do you have a view on why there is that seeming disparity? Well, once people discover any podcast, they're into it. I think they're pretty committed. It's so easy to listen to the back catalog. So, you know, it's so easy on any podcast app or catcher to just start with this one yeah. and then go yeah. to that one. Yeah. And then, yeah. But it's not on Facebook to find, okay, where's her last video or his last video or where are all of these things? The way the content is presented in apps, it's so easy. Once they get over the hump of actually signing up for any podcast and they find yours and they love it, boom, it's so easy to go through the entire mm -hmm, catalog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely see that. That multitasking just opens up the space, really. It opens up the, the possibilities, you know, when you're driving or another saying I have is that podcast reaches the places that other content can't. So it can just get to you in all those other places. And, and I think, you know, where people who maybe have naturally the desire to multitask or just massively into wine and passionate about wine yeah. and want to keep the conversation going the audio gives them the opportunity to do that which no other medium can so that's true and you know you reach new listeners as well i mean you think about people who are blind or have some sort of vision issue mm -hmm. you're definitely suited to them 
And I find like I stream, so I'll publish my podcast first, but then I'll stream the video of it, mm, our video mm, conversation mm, of it. Mm, mm. A week or two later, they're two different audiences. I always think, oh, they're going to get bored. They've already listened to the <laughs> podcast. Now they're here for the video. Yeah. It's actually two different audiences for the most part. Of course, there's keeners who watch and listen, but you know, people consume media in different ways. And so you have to come to where they are. But I think by far, podcast still wins over the video. My podcast audience is mm-hmm. far larger mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. viewers on any particular video. Amazing. And it may not be possible kind of for that exact reason, but do you have a sort of paint an image really, or, a, you know, an avatar of what your podcast listener looks like versus what your video viewer looks like? Yeah, that's a tough one. I haven't done readership surveys recently, or at least since I started the podcast. So I'm not sure if in general, my podcast audience reflects podcast listeners in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think you can reach a far broader demographic via podcasting than you can via, say, TikTok, which I'm assuming is a younger audience. But you know, if you're trying to reach, you have to be a little bit, a little tiny bit tech savvy. So I do think lots of younger millennials Mm -hmm, and younger mm -hmm, listen to podcasts, mm -hmm. but I think it's not such a difficult medium to get the hang of. You're getting the older demographics as well and everything in between. So I do think it then becomes interest driven and you're going to catch the demographics across the board if they've got that passion for wine. Yeah, 100%. I mean, just thinking back, that was one of the most fascinating things was actually going into Spotify and pulling off the data around who listens to interpreting wine. And the two largest age groups were the younger and the older. It was that sort of 18 to, I think, 25 was the band, and I think 55 to 65. And they were far and away the ones that were sort of leading the path. And, uh, you know, this is, again, another thing around when you do something digitally, you get all of this sort of fine grain detail. Yes. That, that you may miss, you know, if you say write things something into a magazine and you put it out there, you don't know as somebody seen your advert or read your article on page sixty three, <laughs> how much exactly. have they read? You know, were there particular parts that they reread? All of that data is absolutely accessible from podcast providers and get some really quite juicy, <laughs> interesting insight into how people are consuming. Yeah, it's far more measurable. You can tell what were your best episodes, therefore the most interesting topics. As you say, you can tell where people drop off, stop listening, and then you can adjust and iterate based on that data. 100%. And I'm very, very keen really to, you know, essentially we've been talking at a fairly high level around podcasts and the trends and how people engage, which is, you know, absolutely fascinating to me. But Given that you're here and you've got this fantastic body of work behind you, I wonder if you'd sort of, yeah, lower the drone a little bit and get us down into the weeds a little bit. And yeah, maybe talk to us about some of the episodes and the experiences that really stand out from, I think, your now three plus years of producing your podcast. Sure. So I think over time, I've refined the types of guests I'm looking for, which is why I reached out to you, Lawrence, (laughs) because you know how to tell stories. (laughs) So I've been interviewing a lot of writers and or podcasters Mm. because 100% is about storytelling. And so at first I thought it would be mostly winemakers because they have a story to tell, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. they have to know how to tell a story. It's not good enough just to say, this harvest was, I don't know, the rains came in September, et cetera, et cetera. You have to get in there, dig out your personal feelings and put that together in a compelling way that the listener is going to resonate. And even if, yeah, if the listener hasn't worked a harvest, but they sure as heck know what it is to slip a disc, feel that pain and still have to carry on or something. Mm -hmm. You've Mm -hmm. got to, Mm -hmm. as we say in writing, show, not tell. So don't tell me it was a hard, difficult harvest. Show me some details that speak to that. So over time, the best episodes have been storytellers. Among winemakers, Randall Graham, of course, Charles Back at Fairview Wines in South Africa, Thomas Belchador in Niagara, Ontario. Mm -hmm. Thomas was a former journalist. So it's almost like for any wine communicator, be a writer or a communicator first and a wine expert second is my best 
advice. And those have been the best episodes, those who focused on that. So I think there's lots we can all learn, even if we don't want to be professional writers Mm -hmm, or podcasters, mm -hmm. as winemakers, as sommeliers, as even just fans of consumers of wine, you can improve, you can up your communication game by learning from the best. So there's so many great books like Stephen King on writing. He wrote a book that's kind of a memoir biography about writing tips. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Anne Lamott's mm -hmm. Bird by Bird, Mm -hmm. Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Angler. I can send you these for your show notes if you like. Yeah, yeah. they're amazing Mm -hmm. for anyone. You know, you don't have to want to have a, a, be professional at it, but I think we all need to become better storytellers. So back to your question, the best episodes have very much been storytelling winemakers. And then just, I really do focus on writers and podcasters, especially those with new books coming out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or who mm -hmm. have podcasts that are engaging. So you're in that category. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And I think, yeah, you can look back and see the stats coming through. I mean, certainly something I did over the summer was to try to just get my arms around (laughs) some of the data that that was out there on my podcast and did, I think, a similar thing to you. I said, okay, who were the people? I'd interviewed 170 or so winemakers. I'd interviewed more than 20 masters of wine. I'd I'd interviewed sort of in the teens of educators and, you know, people who teach about wine. And I saw that gap. I saw that gap in my audience. And actually, it was the educators who were number one. And there was quite a bit of a gap there. And I inferred something very similar, that if you're an educator, you are communicating and you also are usually doing it in a long form. You're needing to hold people's attention. You need to have those hooks out there. As you quite rightly say, you're needing to take them on this journey. And it's not sort of, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And here's just an audio version of the tech sheet, it's actually more around a story and making sure that that person is going to be, yeah, I guess, as engaged at the start of your lesson with them as they are at the end. Exactly. And the hook is everything. You have to dive in feet first. Think about your favorite mystery novels. They start with a line that's right in the middle of the action, yeah, usually. Yeah, yeah. My mother wasn't the first one I thought I would kill in my <laughs> professional career as an assassin, but... It turns out that was it. And so there's no backstory. You you don't lead up to, I was born in Kansas or Concord, Maine or wherever. And then eventually, you know, I didn't like my mother. You've got to dive in feet first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, And then mm -hmm, you get the permission, mm -hmm. once you have their attention, to back out and give some backstory and Mm -hmm, whatever other mm -hmm, points you mm -hmm, want to make. mm -hmm. So you've got to hook them right up front. Do you think that can be done in an audio format? Is there an equivalent of that? Yes. Well... There's a couple of techniques. I mean, every audio podcast, I put a little snippet at the beginning of my podcast that is the juiciest bit of what someone said. Even before you hear the intro to my podcast, nothing else. I do it in my newsletter too. Mm -hmm. I don't have a graphic Mm -hmm. at the Mm -hmm. top. I Mm -hmm. have the juiciest bit. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a personal bit. A la Laura Belgray, our our favorite copywriter, (laughs) right? Get right in there. And so you'll have the juicy quote, just a couple of sentences or whatever of them speaking. Intro, then the three questions, because you want to open a loop, right? Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. not only are we wired for stories, we're wired to know what the answers are. So, you know, in my most recent one, I interviewed Mallory O'Meara, who just published the book Girly Drinks on the history of women and alcohol. Fascinating. My questions were, did you know that? Queen Cleopatra in Egypt had her own private drinking club with Mark Antony, and that's how her empire fell. Did you know that the first wine bars were actually designed for women, not men? Did you know about alewives and how the church shut them down? They were the first beer makers. So you want to find, okay, what are the answers here? So you open the loops. So you tease with something at the beginning, open the loops. For me in podcasting, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. jumping in feet first. And then I introduce the guest and we go into it. Fantastic. And you, I think, yeah, have been one of the leading wine podcasters out there now since, I think you said 2018? 2018. 2018. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, again, from a slightly different angle, I'm, I'm curious as to what your output has been like really over that time. Have you grown consistently by putting out sort of you know regular content that I guess the audience kind of comes to rely on and to look forward to 
And has that changed at any point at all over that last sort of three plus years? Sure. I mean, what's changed is I've gotten fussier about my guests because I get pitched probably like you, Lawrence, mm-hmm. with lots of mm-hmm. winemakers. Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, I know you're the third generation and you pick between the raindrops, but give me a story. So I've gotten fussier about the guests. I tend to pursue my guests rather than yeah. them come to me. Yeah. But yeah. there's all, always an occasional ex- exception when someone knows how to pitch a story. Or if I think they can tell a story, they might mm-hmm. not have pitched it right. But if I think there's a story there and I can draw it out of them. So that's changed. I've always had the podcast once a week, and I've just followed my own personal interests of what I'd like to learn about. My podcast, probably like you, has been a form of my continuing wine education. It's how I learn and push further into my own knowledge of wine. Mm -hmm. I love your idea, though, and I'm going to talk to you about this on my podcast, Mm -hmm. Lawrence, but Mm -hmm. I love your Netflix series kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to dig into that because I think that's fascinating, the way you'll do five or six episodes on a particular topic or region or whatever. I haven't ever done that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of interesting. But really, I mean, the evolution has just been drilling down on interesting guests and stories and following my own passions and interests. I'm always watching who's got a new wine book or drinks book. It's mostly wine published because usually, A, they're motivated to promote it and B, they know how to tell a story. Yeah, absolutely. And what about where people are listening? Has that also changed over time or is it stayed um, fairly consistent? Yeah. I do get lots of emails and anyone listening to this is welcome to email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com if you've got a comment. But I also love to know where people are listening. Mm-hmm. And I start my videos with that too. And so it's often, you know, this multitasking, doing something else, commutes. Well, they used to be bigger than they were pre-COVID, yeah. but people came back to podcasting even during COVID and now that it continues. They find other ways, whether it's lying down for an afternoon nap or, you know, doing other errands, physical errands. The podcast audience has continued to climb. You think, oh, it's going to diminish with commuting gone, but it hasn't. It's grown. People found new ways and new people found podcasting as they searched for ways to entertain themselves now that they had maybe an hour or two freed up from not commuting. But I get bizarre answers too, like in a submarine, (laughs) you know, at the zoo with my kids, you know, so they'll download all the, that's another thing that people can pre-download and even when you don't have internet access, you can still be listening. So it's everywhere. There's no escape. (laughs) (laughs) There isn't. (laughs) And once we find you, (laughs) you must listen. That's it. it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think my favorite ever one was being tagged on Instagram. I think it was a New York state. I think it was Finger Lakes farmer okay. who had four hours of leaf blowing to do <laughs> on the tractor <laughs> and I was you know honored to be in their ear during that because it was a fairly repetitive task just keep the tractor straight you know they had the attachment to do the leaf blowing so that they didn't have to get down but just keep it straight don't go off path and that was That's the, great. the audio it- to drive by. <laughs> No, it wasn't because you're a blowhard yourself. No, 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 no. It's just a leaf blowing. (laughs) That's great. No, I love hearing those stories. It makes me visualize my listeners. I want that picture too. Absolutely. And yeah. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Francis. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, the full transcript of my conversation with Lawrence, links to his website and podcast, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. You'll also find a link to my free Ultimate Guide to Wine and Food Pairing. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 219. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or would like to be a beta reader of my new memoir at natalie at nataliemclean.com. If you missed episode three, go back and take a listen. I chat about why you like the wines you do with Marnie Old and Jean-Charles Boisset. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. And for many people, one of the reasons it's hard to put your finger on exactly what it is that you like or dislike about a wine is because it's so difficult to learn to recognize and describe the tactile elements of wine, the things that you feel on impact, the prickle of carbonation, the, the kind of bracing knife-like edge of acidity, the mouth 
filling richness that we get with higher alcohol content in the wine and so on. These are not simply aspects of wine that are important to its taste or to its smell, but also to the way that it impacts on the palate. Mm -hmm. And that I have to tell you is often the make or break factor for many people about whether they like a wine and want to try it again, mm -hmm. or whether they would rather try something new next time. If you liked this episode, please email or tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines, tips, and stories we shared. You won't want to miss next week when I continue my chat with Lawrence Francis. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a wine that you remember for its backstory. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.